So um, the first talk of the afternoon is the third of a series of three talks by Mark Haller, each uh, volume and topology three applications. Okay, the, the good news is Elia has found me a clicker that's suitable for my pudgy fingers. <laughs> the slides won't disappear. Uh, okay, so I think that was where we ended last time, was with this log 2k minus 1 theorem. Uh, I've dropped the hypothesis about parabolics here, though. So, three climbing group with basis elements uh, gamma 1 through gamma n. Uh, and then it satisfies this inequality, which is telling you that, well, in particular, when uh, some of the basis elements have short translation lengths, others have to have long translation lengths, or long displacements, I mean, and that's for any point. And uh, the sort of uh, middle case, uh, you can see that, I mean, when they're all equal, you get log 2k minus 1. So at least one of the basis elements has to move every point a distance at least log 2k minus 1. So I want to try to apply it to geometry now. Um, so let me make this definition. So uh, say that a group is k-free if it has the property that any time you take a set of k elements in the group, they'll generate a free group. Of course, they won't necessarily be a basis for a free group, but they will generate a free group. So in particular, that means that k-freeness is like or ascending conditions. To say that it's three free is stronger than saying that it's two free. And uh, we talked about this theorem last time, which says that if you take a closed hyperbolic three manifold, then you have these two possibilities. Either the fundamental group is two free, or the manifold is finitely covered by something which has got a two generator fundamental. Uh, there's really a more general version of this. If you assume that there aren't any surface groups inside the fundamental group up to genus K, and that uh, every K generator subgroup has infinite index, then you can conclude that the fundamental group is K-free. So uh, that's rather, that's a, maybe a mysterious condition, this K-freeness, but um, I just wanted to point out that it is something that you can verify concretely. So, uh, for example, if the rational homology has rank bigger than k, that's going to tell you that every k generator subgroup will have infinite index. And then if you also knew that there weren't surface groups inside the fundamental group, you could conclude it was k free. And well, in our case, I'm mostly interested in so far, in the beginning, with the two free condition, but I'm going to discuss three free and four free as well. So there's also a mod p test. Uh, yeah, question. How does this theorem? Well, most manifolds are two free. So. <laughs> So it's not saying it's not telling you anything about the homology of the cover or anything like that. So I'm not sure why you. I mean, even the well, if there's a two generator cover, that doesn't really tell you anything about whether it's Hawking or not. And if it's got an infinitely an infinite index cover, which is got a two free fundamental group that also doesn't tell you anything about the <coughs> virtual properties because it's infinite index. So I don't think it's related to virtual bucket. It's just saying that uh, if you don't have any tori, then when you take the uh, covering space corresponding to a two generator subgroup and the <coughs> and it's infinite, it's not compact, then it's really a genus two handle body. Uh, okay, so you can test this condition with mod p homology as well. If you have mod p homology of rank k 
plus 1 for some time, and k generator subgroups will have infinite index. The, the strategy of the proof is, well, the k generator subgroup is going to lift to a p-fold cover because of the rank condition. Now, the p-fold cover might have a homology of rank 1 less, but you're starting out with one extra, and then you have to argue that as you keep taking p-fold covers, the homology increases after the second step. So your k-generator subgroup will lift all the way up through the tower of finite index, or index p subgroups, and it has to have infinite index. Uh, so that was a result of Shalin and Wagreich that uses uh, Stalling's five-term exact sequence again. Okay, so a, a consequence then is that if the fundamental group of your manifold is too free, your closed hyperbolic manifold, then there's a point in the manifold where there are no loops of length less than log 3. So the ball of radius log 3 over 2, about that point, will be an embedded ball. Or you could say the injectivity radius of m is going to be at least log 3 over 2 at some point somewhere in the manifold. So uh, I just want to sketch a proof of this because uh, the ideas are going to come up later. Uh, this is fairly simple, but the idea is uh, look at a maximal cyclic subgroup in the fundamental group. Well, that's a group of element isometries that are translating along some axis. And so you can take the uh, cylinder z sub lambda of c, you can kind of find it to be. So that's all the points in hyperbolic space that are shifted a distance less than lambda by some element of the group. And so that's one of these bananas, an open cylinder. Well, so let's take lambda to be log 3. So if I have two distinct maximal, abelian, maximal cyclic subgroups I'm looking at, and if I had a point which was in the intersection of their sets where they displace things less than a distance log 3, then that would violate the log 3 theorem <coughs> because I would have these two distinct maximal cyclic subgroups would generate a non-cyclic two-generator group which would be uh, free of rank 2 according to the 2 free condition. But I found a point inside both cylinders, so that means I found a point that was translated less than log 3 by both of the generators of that free group, and that's not legal. So that means that those cylinders, the log 3 <coughs> displacement cylinders, have to all be disjoint. Well, you can't cover hyperbolic space with a family of disjoint open cylinders. So somewhere there's a point that's not in any of these log 3 displacement cylinders, and that's going to be a place where every element of the group moves at more than log 3. Uh, okay, so, well, I want to, I mean, so that's a statement about injectivity radius, but we'd like to have a statement about volumes, and so for that I need a little uh, sort of classical geometry, and then I'll add some less classical geometry and get an improvement over what we get here. But let's take this situation first. So we know that we have a ball of a certain size embedded in the manifold. So now lift that ball up to hyperbolic space. Look at all of its lifts. And you have a family of disjoint balls of all the same radius sitting in hyperbolic space, which is uh, known as a ball packing. Or maybe it's a sphere packing, but I think Ecologists are supposed to call them balls, right? Uh, so if you take one of the balls in this family, then it has a Dirichlet domain. That means take all the points which are closer to the center of that ball than to any of the other centers, or less than or equal. Uh, so that's some sort of uh, compact polyhedron in hyperbolic space, which is actually a fundamental domain for the action of the fundamental group of gamma in hyperbolic space. So if you want to compute the volume of the manifold, 
you could equally well compute the volume of the Dirichlet domain of the ball packing that you get. But uh, the point is that's going to be bigger than the ball because it's a polyhedron and the ball is you know, sitting inside of it, but there are these corners that stick out and so on. Now you'd like to quantify exactly how much it's bigger if you want to get a volume estimate. So uh, this is a theorem of Beruchki. So he uh, gives an estimate for the density of a ball packing in hyperbolic space. It's an n-dimensional theorem, actually, but just stating it for three. Uh, I'm, I'm made a policy of not writing down formulas for functions. But that doesn't mean the formulas don't exist. So he shows that the volume of the Dirichlet domain is at least the volume of the ball divided by some density function that is, there's an explicit formula for, but I'm not writing it down. So anytime you find one of these points where the injectivity radius is such and such, then you get a volume estimate, which is strictly bigger than the volume of the ball by some quantitative amount. Uh, and in this case, the way it works is uh, if the fundamental group is 2 free, so you have a point where the injectivity radius is log 3 over 2, then uh, you can calculate this function d at that radius. And the conclusion is that the volume is 0.929 or so. Which, uh, yeah. That's the point. It's, I'm looking at a ball of radius. Well, I have, I, I index the point. I have the, all the lifts of this point to hyperbolic space. Some countable lattice there. And I'm just looking at, well, I mean, in his, so his statement is really not just for regular ball packing. It's an arbitrary ball packing. So you have a countable collection of disjoint balls of the same radius in hyperbolic space. Each one has a Dirichlet domain. Maybe different in different ones. But in our case, they're all homogeneous. So we get this estimate for the volume. It's just a little bit less than the what's now known to be the smallest volume of any closed hyperbolic manifold. So at one point, uh, Peter Shalin and I and Sara Hersonsky worked really hard to improve the log three theorem, and we managed to show that actually it, you could get this above the volume of the weak span. <laughs> uh, OK, so uh, while I'm at it, there are other kinds of uh, packing estimates in the world. So in fact, Baruchki's theorem applies in the limit if you take uh, the centers of these balls and move them to the sphere at infinity, then you get a horrible packing. And the density of that, you have to be a little careful with the definition now, but there's a local density for that. And it's the limit of the, his density function as the radius goes to uh, some number like 0.85 there. So this actually lets you estimate the volume of a cusp neighborhood in a manifold with a finite volume manifold with cusps. Because if you lift the cusp neighborhood, what you're looking at is a horoball packing. And the horoballs have, well, I guess you don't call them Dirichlet domains, you call them Ford domains. But they have uh, these polyhedra defined by the same definition. And so the, the quotient of the Ford domain by the parabolic subgroup is going to be uh, something that embeds in the manifold. And you can then get an estimate for the cusp neighborhood from the same procedure. And you can do better, you can do different from that as well. Um, you can look at cylinders. So you can say, suppose you have a family of disjoint cylinders. Each one is a, say, a fixed radius around some axis then uh, you can still define a Dirichlet domain for that as well. You take all the points that are closer to one axis than to all the other axes, you get some sort of polyhedron. And you can ask the, it's again a local density, but what's the ratio of the volume of the Dirichlet domain to the volume of the cylinder? And uh, Andrew Przeworski has given estimates for that. 
which uh, looks like uh, the smaller of uh, the number 0.91 and some other function that he writes down. Uh, oh. Oh, yeah, I, I did give a corollary about volumes, right? Yes. So we have a corollary which gives the volume of a two free manifold uh, just from the sphere packing. So now I want to actually go a little further and get a better estimate for the volume of a two free manifold by using some fancier stuff. Uh, so uh, here's an, a, a theorem that I guess we probably should have mentioned a long time ago. But anyway, it's a, a theorem of Steve Kirchhoff that if you have a closed or a finite volume hyperbolic manifold and you, you take a geodesic embedded in the manifold, then when you remove that geodesic, the result, which is a three manifold with, which is the interior of a three manifold with torus boundary, uh, that is also a hyperbolic manifold again. So you not only have the operation of Dane filling, but you also have drilling, where you can take a closed geodesic and drill that out and get a manifold with one larger cut number of cusps. Uh, so uh, there's an amazing recent theorem. Uh, it's amazing for one thing because it actually applies the estimates that come up in Perelman's reaching for the paper. Uh, and the, the gist of it is to give, to make explicit the amount that the volume decreases when you do a Dane filling, uh, except it's sort of, uh, done the other way around. So you're doing it drilling instead. So the theorem is, uh, if you start with a closed oriented hyperbolic three manifold and you take the shortest geodesic in the manifold and drill it out, uh, so then you get a manifold which has one cusp. How, how are the two volumes related? And uh, so this was a paper of Agall, Storm, and W. Thurston, and then an appendix by Dunfield. And they get this formula which uh, relates the volume of the uh, drilled manifold to the volume of the closed manifold. Is it important that C is shortest? Uh, I think it's important that C is shortest. Yeah. You didn't have an estimate like that before. Yeah, he had one before, which uh, didn't use Perelman, but it used ECG. Uh -huh. And this gave it, this is stronger. Uh, but if you, so I've rewritten their formula. Oh, yeah. What's, what's T? <coughs> oh, what is T? I'm sorry. <laughs> Good question. T is the maximal embedded tube around this shortest geodesic. It's at least important that it's shortest for my application. Uh, so if you, take a, if, you, if you take a geodesic in the manifold and you lift it to the universal cover, to get an axis in hyperbolic space. And then you imagine taking uh, cylinders of radius r around that axis, around the whole family of lifts, and expanding those until they bump. Then you get a maximal tube in the manifold. I mean, you get a maximal cylinder, which is disjoint from its translates. And if you divide that cylinder by the cyclic group, you get a tube around the GDS. Maybe I should have mentioned that um, in the definition of these cylinders, it's a little bit tricky when you have rotations. It's not necessarily the case that the generator of the cyclic group is the one that moves points near the axis the smallest amount. Um, anyway, so, but yeah, so I re rewrote this formula because in this way because it now involves the ratio of the volume of this embedded tube to the volume of the manifold. And that's something which Przeworski has estimated for us, because the ratio volume of tube over volume of manifold is less than the ratio volume of tube over volume of Dirichlet domain, which uh, he can estimate. So uh, Przeworski's theorem would say that if the radius, in a special case, if the radius of the tube were more than 1 half log 3, then the volume of the drilled manifold is no more than uh, 3.018 times the volume of the filled manifold. 
This is not the same one half log three that's been appearing in the other theorems. This is a different one half log three. Maybe it's coincidentally the same, uh, but it is a one half log three that comes up in this work of uh, Gabay Meyerhoff and and Thurston, Nathaniel Thurston. Uh, so uh, the point of their work was to prove this strong version of Mostar rigidity, which says that a manifold homotopy equivalent to a hyperbolic manifold actually is a hyperbolic manifold. That's a situation that slips out of Mostar rigidity because you're assuming that you have two manifolds that were both hyperbolic and homotopy equivalent to each other. And this says you don't actually have to assume that they're both hyperbolic. But in the, in the course of doing this, uh, there's one part of this proof, which is a huge calculation that essentially runs through all two generator Kleinian groups in a certain sense, like I mentioned last time. And uh, you can sort of summarize uh, one conclusion of this computation, as I did here. So if you take the shortest geodesic in the manifold, what they prove is that generically, the largest tube around the shortest geodesic will have radius at least one half log three. That's why it's a different one half log three. Uh, but there are cases that their argument doesn't handle. So that's the second bullet there. So the other possibility is that there are these seven little boxes inside of this three complex dimensional parameter space where uh, your group would have to lie if it, if it were the case that it failed to have a uh, log three over two cylinder around its shortest geodesic. So, I mean, it's conjectured that the list of groups that lie, that are discrete and lie in those boxes are known, I guess, and it's their partial results and so on. But maybe the point for me at the moment is just that they all have two generator fundamental groups. So either the manifold has a log three over two tube around its shortest geodesic, or it's finitely covered by a, a two generator manifold, which is the case we're not <coughs> considering here. Okay, so now here's another theorem about tubes, which is an application of the log three theorem, but it's, it's an application of the strong form of the log three theorem, because it's using that if, uh, it's one element of a, if you have a point that's moved a really short distance by some isometry, and another element that co-generates a free group with it, the other one has to move it a large distance. So maybe I'll just uh, give you the gist of the calculation. It's a, it's a trigonometry computation, but the idea is you have some element uh, in the isometry group, which is the fundamental group of the manifold, with a very short translation length. So you have a, a short geodesic in the manifold. And you take a conjugate of that element, which will have an axis some distance away. And you would like to argue that the distance between these two axes, so if you were to drop a perpendicular between them, you want to argue that if this translation length is very short, then the distance between the axes has to be large. And the argument is, well, you look at the element with the short translation length here, and you look at some conjugate of it, which translates along this line, and you uh, figure out which conjugate to use based on where the closest point between the, from this axis to that one lies. And then you take the group generated by those two, which will be free in the two free case, and you, you calculate hyperbolic triangles, how far apart do the two lines have to be, and that gives you a bound on the two radius. So, could you read the yes. sentence, please? Yes. B of L goes to pi as... Oh, cut it off. B of L goes to pi as L goes to zero. <laughs> yeah, so what happens, I mean, that's another uh, formula I'm not writing down, but it's some explicit formula. Uh, the the tube around this short geodesic has to have at least a certain volume. And if you write down the formula and take the limit as the length goes to zero, the answer is pi. OK, 
Okay, so uh, with this we could give a stronger estimate of the volume in the two free case. Yeah. Uh, so this is not the strongest theorem that we proved here, but uh, result with Ian Eckel and Peter Shalin. Uh, we um, I stated that in a slightly funny way, maybe. Uh, it might be more natural to state it that if the lot P homology has rank greater than 3, then the volume is greater than 1.22. Because mod P homology of rank greater than 3 would imply 2 free. And so then I could deduce from this that if the mod P homology has rank at least, has rank greater than 3, uh, you get this volume estimate of 1.22. And actually, by working harder, we can do it for homology of rank greater than 2, except for two primes that don't behave. The reason those two primes don't behave is they're related to the seven boxes in the uh, Gabi Meyerhoff Thurston result. Anyway, so uh, this would be the argument, which kind of uses all the machinery that we've been talking about here, I guess. So take the shortest geodesic. Uh, well, the group is too free, so the maximal embedded tube around that geodesic is going to have radius at least one half log three, according to the Gabi Meyerhoff Thurston result. So you drill it out, you get a hyperbolic manifold, and look at the cusp neighborhood in that cusp hyperbolic manifold, the drilled manifold. Well, if you're a little bit careful about choosing framings, you can always find infinitely many different Dane fillings that you can do to get closed manifolds that still have well, I guess I cheated. <laughs> um, I, I rewrote the statement. I have to this statement is wrong. The statement should assume, like I said, that the homology is with mod P coefficients is at least four. I'm really using that. It implies two free, but I didn't state it there. Okay, so uh, assume the homology is rank at least has rank greater than three. So then, if you do the Dane fillings in the right way, they will also have plenty of homology because you can just kill off something which is uh, p times some element of the peripheral subgroup won't affect the homology. So you'll be able to conclude that the fundamental group is too free from the homology condition. And then uh, apply the hyperbolic gain filling theorem. So this will say that when these infinitely many, this infinite sequence of coefficients, when they get large, then uh, you're going to get hyperbolic manifolds, first of all. And second of all, the lengths, when you do the filling, the lengths of the core curves inside of the filling tori are going to approach zero. And the maximal tubes around those short geodesics approach the cusp neighborhood in this cusp manifold that you get by drilling. So that means that the cusp manifold has a cusp neighborhood of volume at least pi by taking the limit. And so you do the calculation. Uh, the volume of the drilled manifold is at least pi over the density of a four ball uh, packing. But on the other hand, it's less than 3.018 times the volume of the filled manifold. And when you do the division, you get an estimate of like 1.22, which is actually fairly close among, if you look at the stronger version of this theorem, which deals with uh, mod p homology of rank at least two. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I wanted to kind of uh, systematically look at these conditions, uh, the two free fundamental group, the three free, and the four free, and what does it mean about the geometry? Um, is the weak sample the only less than the closest three manifolds? No, no, there are others. Yeah, there are several less than 1.22. What's the smallest known manifold that's covered by the hypothesis of this theorem? Well, uh, I forget. 
Uh, I think if you if you look at the manifolds of volume less than 1.22, you find manifolds which have uh, homology of rank three, but it involves two or seven. That's what I think happens. So I think the the strong form of this is actually kind of false in that sense. <laughs> yeah, well, no, um, because of this this issue with the two and seven. Although, if, if they resolve the question of whether the manifolds inside the seven boxes are the six different manifolds that they're believed to be, then actually it would, it would give you that. Some, few of them are resolved. And some of them are resolved already, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Uh, okay, so what can you say then about uh, a manifold that has three free fundamental group? Uh, well, so, so here's the result that um, goes back to our paper with Anderson and Canary, um, but now is strengthened by the tangles there. Um, so, we can actually prove that if the fundamental group is three free, then you have a point where the injectivity radius is log five over two. The exact <coughs> analog of what happens for the two free case, where you got one half log three. So let me just sketch how this goes. So it's a similar argument to the one I gave in a sense because it involves looking at these cylinders. So you take the uh, maximal cyclic subgroups in the group, and you look at these translation cylinders, so all the points that get moved a distance less than log five by some element in that cyclic subgroup. And if, just as in the other case, if you want to prove that the cylinders can't cover hyperbolic space to find a point which lies outside of all of them, which will then have large injectivity radius, uh, you just have to show that that's not possible. So. Uh, the idea, though, is here is that um, we'll construct out of all of these cylinders a certain complex. So the vertices of the complex will take to be actually the maximal cyclic subgroups, and then take edges to be pairs of maximal cyclic subgroups whose cylinders overlap, and so on. So. Uh, will argue that the, so I mean, I'm arguing by contradiction. I'm assuming there's no point of injectivity radius log five over two. Therefore, the cylinders cover hyperbolic space, open sets covering hyperbolic space. And if I take the nerve of that covering, it will be homotopy equivalent to hyperbolic space, so it'll be contractible. So I just have to show that the nerve isn't contractible. So uh, these, the open coverings give you the complex, where the vertices are the cyclic groups, and a simplex is a bunch of cyclic groups whose cylinders have a common intersection. But it has extra structure to it coming from the cyclic groups. So uh, if I take a simplex in this complex, I want to assign to it a group. And I'm allowing the simplex to be either open or closed. I don't care. But the group I want to assign to it is just the group generated by all the cyclic subgroups that are its vertices. So I'm, I'll call that uh, theta of delta, this subgroup of the fundamental group, corresponding to a simplex. So in this setup, if we're assuming that the fundamental group is k-free, and I have a k minus 1 simplex, so I have k different cylinders meeting, uh, I know First of all, that those k vertices generate a group of rank k, because they're only k of them. But um, it has to be free according to the k free condition. But if it were free of rank k, that would violate the log 2k minus 1 theorem. So what you know is that for each of these groups, when you take a k minus 1 simplex, uh, this, the vertices generate a free group 
which has rank less than k, k minus 1 or less. So there always are some kinds of relations that hold among the groups in the vertex of a k minus 1 simplex, the vertices. Uh, so let me just imagine I have some subcomplex of this big complex, which I'm thinking of as maybe a union of open or closed simplices in a pair. Uh, then I can assign to that subset a group, which is a group generated by all the vertices of all the open or closed simplexes in the set. Uh, OK, so I need uh, one more definition here. I, uh, a group will be said to have local rank at most r if every finitely generated subgroup is actually inside of a finitely generated subgroup of rank at most r. So here's a, a key lemma. Uh, so I'm, let me suppose the fundamental group of my manifold is k-free. I'm going to apply this lemma in the, in the four free case as well. Uh, so look at the log 2k minus 1 displacement cylinders and construct this complex that I'm talking about. And suppose I, I take a subset of the complex now, which is a union of k minus 1 and k minus 2 simplices, open ones. And suppose that the group associated with those simplices has rank r for each simplex. Then the group associated to the whole set will have local rank R. And in particular, it will be a locally free group. <coughs> locally free means every finitely generated subgroup is free. And there are lots of free manifold groups with the property that they're locally free, but not free. Um, every finitely generated subgroup is free, but the entire group is not free. I guess the canonical example is you take a punctured torus and you glue its boundary to a curve around the hole, and then take the universal cover, which is a whole chain of these punctured tori stuck together. And if you look at the boundary of one of those punctured tori in the cover, you see that it's a commutator of arbitrarily large depth. It's a commutator of commutators of commutators of commutators, which can't happen in a free group. So there are not such hard examples of things, just to point out that you do have to deal with this. Uh, OK, so uh, how do you prove this lemma? Well, you prove it by induction. You take this set of simplexes, and you start adding simplexes <coughs> one at a time. Um, the dimensions are either, well, in the, in the three free case, uh, we'd be looking at either one or two simplexes that we're gluing together. Uh, so you need to figure out what happens at each stage as you add a simplex. So you're going to, you may be adding one of the smaller simplexes to an ascending union of these things that you have. And that doesn't actually do anything because that simplex is a face of something that was already there. So we know uh, the group doesn't change. But the sort of key induction step would be so you've built up this set Y, where the fundamental group has local rank R. And now you're adding one simplex, a, a large one, K minus one dimensional one, uh, along some K minus two dimensional face, which is already in this set Y. Uh, so, if you, so what you're doing is you're adding one extra generator to the fundamental group, or to the group theta of Y. Uh, so I'm calling it C. It's the, I mean, C is the cyclic group generated by the corresponding to that vertex. Uh, so I've, I've, I'm looking at the group generated by theta of Y and the cyclic group C, and that's theta of this next stage in the induction. If I were to take any finitely generated subgroup of that group generated by theta of Y and one extra <coughs> cyclic group, uh, then um, I can write it as a group generated by something. I'm going to group B, which is inside of 
theta of y, together with this new cyclic group that I added. And by induction, I know that the group B is free and it has rank at most r. So the question is, would it be possible for the rank to actually increase when you have this extra cyclic group? Well, if it did, then uh, the whole S that you have here would be a free product of something with a cyclic group. And inside of that, you would have seen that for your simplex, you had a free product of the base group with another cyclic group, and the rank increased. But we're assuming that all the simplices have rank at most R, so that would be a contradiction to this assumption that, that every simplex has rank R. Okay, so that's a sort of group theoretic uh, complex of groups kind of argument. Uh, so now we can argue that three free manifolds have to have points where the injectivity radius is log five over two. So it, it fits into this lemma. Uh, you look at all of the open one and two simplexes. So I'm leaving out the vertices here. I have to make an argument about that. Uh, so the log three theorem is going to say that for a two simplex, you have a free group. And it can't be abelian because you're, it's generated by distinct cyclic subgroups. So it's actually free of rank two. Um, and also for one simplex, it's going to be free of rank two. It can't be free of rank three for a two simplex because that would violate the log three theorem. So you have to make an argument about the complex now using the fact that it, uh, if you want to understand the link of a vertex in this complement, in this complex, you're really looking at the nerve of a covering of the boundary of a cylinder by intersections with other cylinders. And you have to argue that that's connected, uh, which would mean that you can throw out the vertices and still get something connected. And on the other hand, uh, the lemma we just proved shows that this whole fundamental group has local rank two. So every uh, finitely generated subgroup is contained inside of the subgroup with two generators. And the group that we constructed out of gluing together all of these cyclic groups was invariant under conjugation in the, in, by the fundamental group of the manifold because we took all axes. So it actually gives you a normal subgroup of the fundamental group. And then you need a lemma. If you have a K free group with a normal subgroup, which has local rank at most K, then the whole thing has local rank. Well, if the normal subgroup has rank smaller than K, then the whole thing has rank at most K. So the conclusion is uh, the fundamental group of the manifold is a free group of rank two generated by two elements. It's contained inside of a two-generator group, and therefore it have to be free of rank two. So the cylinders can't cover. OK, so uh, let me just try to say what happens if you now assume that the fundamental group is four free. So we'd be looking at log seven instead of log five now. Uh, so, you know, it would, it would be great if you could prove that when you take the log seven displacement cylinders, they can't possibly cover hyperbolic space because then you would get a point of inject injectivity radius log seven over two, and then you could get a pretty nice volume estimate, 5.7 or so. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be plausible. So uh, what happens instead is that we can prove that there is some point in hyperbolic space which lies in only one cylinder. You can't cover hyperbolic space doubly by these log seven displacement cylinders. This is going to use the same kind of argument as before. So I mean, the, the geometric condition this means is that um, anytime, if you, you're, you're going to find a point in the manifold which has the property that if I take any two geodesics of length less than log seven at that point, they have to commute with each other. So it's kind of a, a one-point 
marvelous number for just that one point. Uh, so we, we call that a lambda semi-thick point. And then we prove two theorems about this. If the fundamental group is floor free, then there exists one of these log seven semi-thick points. In other words, these cylinders can't doubly cover all of hyperbolic space. And then uh, we go on to get a volume estimate assuming that you have that point, uh, which turns out to be 3.44. I'm not going to talk about the geometry part volume estimate, but maybe just uh, a second about the uh, other parts. Why are they contracting? If you're, if you're less than this length, you can't assume that they're contracting. No, you, just, you can have geodesics of length less than log 7 over 2. They're closed geodesics. Well, they're loops, yeah. And so this is saying that if you have two of them, they commute. They're not the same geodesic. You know, if you, if you take if you have a short element and you take a point which lies off the axis and you look at the geodesics that represent different powers of that short element, they're not equal geodesics. Right? They're, they're geodesic loops of some length. But so, I mean, it's possible to have two distinct geodesic loops representing commuting elements. They're not closed geodesics. They have a name. They're not closed. No, they're loops. They're broken geodesics. They just they start at the point and come down. I uh, see. Okay, so I just wanted to sketch this uh, first part that if the fundamental group is four free, then you these log seven displacement zones can't cover hyperbolic space. It has a kind of interesting uh, connection with combinatorial group theory. Uh, okay, so here's the setup. Same business. We have uh, log 7 is our lambda, and we build the same complex. Uh, we have the same conclusion. When you take a 3 simplex, so you have four groups, those four cyclic groups, they have to generate a group which is free, but it can't be free of rank 4. So they have to generate a group of rank, well, 2 or 3. It can't be 1 either. Uh, so. Uh, you can sort of break up the complex into these two parts. You look at the simplexes which have uh, associated groups of rank two and those which have associated groups of rank three. So this is not the dimension of the simplex, but just looking at the rank of the group assigned to the simplex. So these are, you sort of break up the complex into these clumps of either colored by rank two or by rank three. And this lemma that we talked about before works just the same way to say that uh, if you look at the group, at the simplexes whose group has rank 3, uh, then the local rank of the group generated by all those cyclic groups is at most 3. Uh, so then there's the other piece where you have rank 2 groups. Uh, and as it turns out, if you want to make the induction, you, you can do a similar sort of induction. You build these things up, adding one simplex at a time. Uh, but what you run into to do the induction step is you need the following special case of the Hannah Neumann conjecture, which has to do with the rank of subgroups of a free group generated by two groups of given rank. And uh, this was proved for us by uh, Richard Kent and independently by Lars Tyler and John McCann. Uh, if you have two rank two subgroups of a free group and the intersection of those two rank two subgroups also has rank two, then the join, the group they both generate together, has rank two. So that step lets you do the induction and argue that uh, this big thing that you build up from all of the uh, rank two simplexes will have local rank at most two. Okay, so then there's one more step. Uh, these sets aren't necessarily connected. I didn't, you know, they're just sort of clumps of the complex. Uh, so you think about all the components of the 
rank two simplexes and the rank three simplexes. And you build a graph out of those by joining two of them together if they have a common face. And then uh, you need to do another geometric argument involving cylinders to argue that uh, the vertices in this complex actually have contractible links. So we can throw away the vertices and get something simply connected. So what you get that's simply connected retracts to this graph that I was just talking about. So we've constructed somehow out of the, this peculiar complex a simply connected graph that the fundamental group of the three manifold is acting on. It's a tree. But the setup is that the, vert is the vertex stabilizers in this tree, which are the stabilizers of components of these sets, they're all locally free. So we have a three manifold group acting on a tree with locally free vertex stabilizers. But vertex stabilizers, when you have a closed three manifold group acting on a tree, have to have surface groups in them. The surface groups are not locally free. So this is impossible. <coughs> and the cylinders couldn't cover and cover twice. And I'm skipping uh, the geometric consequences of having a log seven semi thick point, so that's the end. Questions? Okay, let's thank Margaret. It might be a good idea to bring your computer to the software session. Oh, no. <laughs> Is it here? In this room? So just before you go, just so you're aware, next Mark will give the next talk at this time. It will be a special software session. On oh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Tomorrow. About software related to geometry. Yeah, maybe I should ask a question. How many people here have ever used this infamous uh, Snap P program? Or how many have not? Okay. Thanks. Well, I'll incorporate that into the presentation. So should we someone don't get